Welcome to Therapist Uncensored, a podcast where therapists freely speak their minds about real life matters. Hi, welcome back. I'm Ann Kelly, and I'm here with a special guest today that I think you all will really enjoy. Her name is Dr. Susan Ann Sorge, and she is a psychologist here in Austin, Texas. She describes herself as a sex literate therapist. And by that, let me tell you how Susan and I work together. I often, as y'all know, do a lot of couples work and run into individuals who really struggle with a topic of sexuality, whether it's them becoming comfortable just with the idea of processing sex or in their partnership. And I often refer to Susan because she's just exceptional. I kind of consider her the sex talk whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Susan. And how do you like that description? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? We've worked together for years. Mm -hmm. And in that process, the way that you've been able to grow people's comfortability, both individually and in their relationship, talking about a topic that frankly can be mm -hmm. a little awkward. Sure. You, you do amazing work. So well, thank you, Anne. <laughs> so we decided to bring the topic to Therapist Uncensored because we're imagining many couples and individuals out there struggle. Absolutely. Yeah. Some of the obstacles that people face are just, you know, what you might think, just embarrassment, a lot of shame around sex, feeling really vulnerable, feeling like they might create a fight situation with their partner if they bring up a topic or if there's a sense that there's some dissatisfaction there at all. You know, I guess it was Esther Perel that talked about Americans being allergic to pleasure. And, you know, I think that's another obstacle right there. It's the idea that you'd be bringing something up, especially for women, you know, that involves really trying to enhance your own pleasure. I know that sounds crazy, but I think it's a real difficult challenge for people in our country, especially women. Oh, I really agree with you. And oftentimes sending somebody over to you that maybe might not even be in touch with their own desires. So some yeah. people feel embarrassed about having it. And some people have really disconnected from the concept of even experiencing their own desire. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. And that can create a real problem. And I guess today what you wanted me to talk about more so is people in partnerships. Is that right? Yeah. Let's stick to that because we're like going to come back, I think, and do a, another episode at another time mm -hmm. talking about sexuality in the beginning of mm -hmm. a relationship okay. because yeah. it, you know, it has some overlaps, but also a lot of differences. Oh, yes. So Absolutely. this podcast is really going to be for those that have been in long term relationships for, you know, any length of time mm -hmm. that talking about sexuality has proven to be somewhat of a challenge. Absolutely. So what do you see if we think about it is couples talking about sexuality? Mm -hmm. You were saying some of the barriers can mm -hmm. be embarrassment and hurt. Mm -hmm. And so how do you help couples or individuals in that process when they mm -hmm. thought, I just, there's no way I could talk about this. I'm way too right. embarrassed. What are some strategies that right. you do to help them? Right. Well, you know, first off, if they're actually in treatment with me, I try to use that situation as a place, kind of a laboratory, if you will, you know, a place where we can really freely talk, throw around terms. Sometimes I'll be talking about the most scientific of terms. Other times I'll be throwing out some four letter words, you know, just sort of trying to see like, what, what are they most comfortable with? And I really find that people tend to first get pretty kind of a little bit stressed out about it. And then quickly, they really relax and just are able to put into words some things that they started off having trouble with. And that's a first step towards priming them to talk with their partner about some of these areas. And maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the areas that tend to come up. I'll have some more strategies and suggestions later. But you know, it might be helpful to think about like, what are we talking about here? Right? You right. know, what are some of the areas that come up in the room when we're talking about talking about sex? <laughs> <laughs> so one of them uh, is, you know, that old desire discrepancy, you know, that's oh, yeah. a big one, right? You know, you got one partner who is wanting it every day and the other partner is happy with it once a week or once a month or once a year. You know, I think of some of the areas of sexual challenge in terms of kind of the what, the how, the when, the, the how often, the where, you know, all those are kind of the basic building blocks. So for instance, the how often is kind of often a desire discrepancy 
question, sort of how frequently are we going to engage, right? Yeah. And I actually find, I don't know if this is your experience, but in my work with couples, that's usually the primary way that they talk uh, that. Mm -hmm. Now, now don't get us wrong. There are many couples that are very comfortable talking about sexualities, but oftentimes that's the most primary dialogue that couples are having is about sexual disparity. And we've talked about this in a previous podcast. Most couples, if not all, yeah. has some level of desire discrepancy. Correct. And yet it can be one of the most painful, pressure filled, all sorts of things. It could really mm-hmm. ha- wreak havoc on a marriage. Absolutely. In my experience, it's the most common topic. If you're going to talk about sex, you're going to talk about somebody wanting it more than the other, the right. hurt feelings. What are but your you thoughts? You know what? That's so interesting when you, when you put it that way, Anne, because I think in some ways it's the least threatening thing to talk about. It's so concrete, right? Yes. Like, how often are we going to do it? Versus things like, what are we doing? How are you touching me? How are we kissing? Are we both satisfied with the way we kiss? What are your turn ons? What are my turn ons? You know, these things are a little bit at that next level, right? That people really would rather just stick to the very concrete of, you know, how often are we going to do it? Right? Right. And when can we and when's what's interrupting and thing? I think you're right. I think it is the least threatening. So it's the most common. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a complaint dynamic between couples. But man, does it add to a lot of hurt? Is that your experience? Oh, absolutely. Because having a desired discrepancy can make the person that has the greater desire feel, you know, so insecure about their desirability. Right. right. And it can also cause the person with the lower desire, ostensibly, to really become cut off from their desire because they're so busy sort of protecting their autonomy physically and, you know, that they don't have any space to feel their own desire. So it's very, can be very toxic. Absolutely. And I think good point is we'll go along. We'll talk about some suggestions right now. We'll keep talking about the obstacle, but it can be very toxic. And that's one reason why we want to broaden the dialogue. Right. And really have this conversation is to broaden the dialogue to other ways of really communicating and warming up the concept of sex, because it could mm-hmm. be one person. I know I work with some individuals that uh, one individual that did not enjoy kissing their partner mm-hmm. and had never told him. Yeah. And it was not a coincidence that they had very little sexual desire. Right. Because, you know, the kissing started happening and the way that he kissed was a real turn off to her. Well, yeah, oh, absolutely. But the thought of actually talking to him about that. Right. Now, they could have all sorts of fights related to how often. But we talked about before the fear, the embarrassment, yeah. that really her big desire not to hurt her husband was huge. And so she just held it all in. Right. But not really doing him any favors by doing that. (laughs) No, it was so painful. So getting back to your point of talking about how we're doing it, et cetera, like really being able to get somebody more comfortable talking about desire and likes and dislikes. Exactly. What's working. So maybe one of the reasons that you have lower desire is because you don't like what's going down when it's going down. Exactly. So it's like, hey, if you're not enjoying sex when it's happening, well, you're going to like want it less frequently. And and so, but again, it's easy to focus on the frequency part and harder to talk about, you know, what's happening when it's happening part. Right. So that's, that's really, really a good point. So how do you help couples or how do you help individuals you know, kind of move on that to right. talk about how do you help right. them actually talk about this is what I the touches that I like. And actually, every time you do this, it makes me want to squirm. Right. That's a tough question, of course. Like, sure. it's, there's no easy answers. But, you know, some of the things that I've found helpful with couples is, you know, sometimes taking the conversation away from the actual sexual interaction. So when you're in bed together naked is such a vulnerable time. You don't always want to bring up. There are some things that like if you're really going to go for doing kind of more of say like a guided experience where you really help someone learn how to touch you in the ways that you want to be touched or, you know, things like that that are more experiential, you may need to have it be in that setting. But oftentimes the initial bringing up of, you know, what you'd like to be different is more successful when it's not right in the moment, you know, when it's because that can feel very shaming. And again, people are very vulnerable. So that's one thing that I often suggest. 
to add to that, what I think could also help that happen, and that is when you're asked. Mm -hmm. So we so often are trying to help somebody approach their partner with something that they don't like, the do's and they don't, but you have to kind of find the right space and time. And I love what you're saying. Not always laying in bed after it happened is the best time to say, hey, by the way, I really didn't like that. Like, not so good. But being able to set up situations where you're inviting a conversation about sex. Yes. And then the question of, hey, what are the things that I do that you like? No. And tell me two things you do that I do. Maybe you wish I wouldn't or that you wish I would do a little different. Because when you're asked and you invite that conversation, man, it feels different to say, well, actually, every time we kiss and the thrust you put your tongue in my mouth is too much. Right. And I feel overwhelmed. And being asked, it makes it so much easier to share that. Well, and absolutely. If you're the person who wants to bring up, you know, some of the issues that you may have sexually in the relationship, then what better way to do it than ask your partner exactly what their experience is, right? You know, and and get the ball rolling in that way. Yeah, to offer them this openness to feedback that you're willing. Yeah. I mean, mind you, the way we're talking about it, Obviously, we're sort of assuming a certain level of kind of comfort with each other. And, you know, I certainly see couples, particularly where there's been a lot of sexual difficulty for a long time, where there's just so much hostility around it. Oh, yeah. That it is very difficult. So I want to just acknowledge that. I don't want to make it sound like this is just easy peasy. It is really hard work. And depending upon how much resentment has built up, or anger has built up, it can feel almost impossible. And that and that's where people do wind up in your office or my office, you know, where it's, it's pretty hard to do on their own. But I think what we're talking about right now is kind of geared more towards couples where there is just a little bit more of that basic trust and comfort generally to allow for this, right? Absolutely. And yet, that's a really good point, because I've seen couples that have a lot of trust in care and so many other things. Yes. But the idea of bringing up sexuality because yes. it has been often because of the disparity and desire has been such a painful dialogue yeah. for them that part of the fear, we're just saying, hey, start talking to your partner. It's right. a good point. Like it's easy. And yet the anxiety, even oh the gosh. thought, in fact, think of it, listener, if you're one of those ones out there listening to us and your heart rate is going up exactly. and you're saying, oh yeah, y'all make it sound so easy. No way we would be in the a knockdown drag out or we wouldn't speak to each other for weeks if I brought these topics up. Hey, we get it. That is really, really true. I have couples more than one or two who have told me that they literally cannot tolerate watching like a sex scene or even a kissing scene in a movie or a television show together. It's so anxiety provoking because sex is such a hot button issue. Right. You know, right. so there you go. So, One of the reasons we're saying that, you know, suggesting that is also to like help you understand that you're not alone out there if Mm -hmm. that's what's going on. And yet to also say helping yourself, whether it is seeking therapy, seeking a counselor, Mm -hmm. helping yourself move towards opening up that dialogue. And, you know, another suggestion we would have is that think about what causes the conflict. And we're going to continue to talk about different dynamics that cause the conflict and maybe that will help. But if you already know something a particular way that you guys are going back and forth and it's particularly painful, ask yourself, have you looked into it for yourself? Mm -hmm. Is there a block to your understanding of your partner? Is there a block to them understanding you? Is there some way that you can emerge into a a more safe dialogue? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think it's also, it's both personally important and interpersonally important because, you know, anything that you're going to be, bringing up, it's really helpful if you kind of own and express your part of it. So for instance, it's like one area that people sometimes get into conflict about is like, how do we initiate sex? Oh my gosh, that's a big one. You know, so it's both a who does it? You know, how often as we've talked about, how do they initiate it? Is it they just grab your butt? Or is it they ask you very clinically? Hey, do you want to go upstairs? And you know, I mean, it. There's so many different ways to sort of be not 
connected and not click on this one. Oh, you know? yeah. So I think like that's a good topic where whatever you bring to the table, you got to own it as like, hey, this doesn't work for me. I'm not saying it would be the wrong way to approach anybody. And maybe it's worked for you, but it's just it's not working for me. And maybe even to express why, like, hey, you know, I have this history of sexual abuse or I have body image issues, whatever it is that may be coming to play in it put that out there as this is my part of the dynamic. And so that's why this doesn't really work for me. And this would work better for me. Oh, I like that last part too. That's such an important, like this is not working and really owning it yourself rather than just tossing criticism to your partner. You know, like, how can you think oftentimes you get, how could you think that would turn me on? Well, they actually might think that would be a turn on. And it might be a turn on for them if you did it to them. Like that's what, you know. Exactly. <laughs> By saying, hey, that doesn't turn me on. But what turns me on is this or this kind of approach would really help get me more yeah. in the mood, yeah. which kind of brings up the whole dynamic of like being able to talk about and actually get to know yourself about what does turn you on. Because I think just the concept of desire, we're talking about discrepant desire, but desire in general is really controversial in, in many couples in trying to understand that. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And what you desire, and you know, we, we haven't talked about fantasy yet, but that's another whole area that's really a wonderful goldmine for couples to talk about what their fantasies are, whether it's something that they hope their partner might be interested in participating in with them, or if it's just something that they share just for the sake of sharing something sexy. You know, the whole realm of fantasy is, again, it's a gold mine of communication as an area. But one thing that we we're talking about before we started was, and you were sharing with me some of the research about the evolution of fantasies over time and particular times of life kind of sparking more of a certain type of fantasy, which I thought was super interesting. I don't know if you want to just like throw some oh, of that yeah, out there. Well, the concept of fantasy, and, and as we kind of started off with a concept that is, especially in some of the Western culture, that we tend to be a little phobic of acknowledging pleasure, the concept of dialoguing about fantasy can mm -hmm. be very challenging, or even sometimes knowing that you can have fantasies. Not everybody, yes. like sometimes you might be out there going, I don't even have fantasies. Yes. I don't know what they're talking about. Right. And you would not be alone. So there are some individuals that allow themselves to have a rich fantasy life. And there's some individuals that it's like a foreign concept. And given that sexual desire is so much prompted by both feeling some sense of novelty and mm -hmm. some sense of maybe obstacles right. in your relationship and being no. in a long-term committed relationship, yeah. those are not always at your at your fingertips. Well, there's usually a lot of obstacles, but they're not very, really sexy obstacles. Good like. point. <laughs> <laughs> so we really want to invite the use of fantasy. So if you haven't allowed that part of your mind to really develop, listen up. But the research you're talking about is a couple of different things. One is that our fantasy life, men and women actually have a lot more similar fantasy life mm -hmm. in, in the actual research mm -hmm. than one would anticipate given sort of what we expect as cultural norms mm -hmm. for men and women. Yeah. 95% of men and 87% of women report, now I guess these would be those willing to fill out a Kinsey format, report having fantasies about threesomes mm -hmm. and group sex. Yeah. So that's a very common fantasy, although very few of them report talking to their partner about this fantasy. Mm -hmm. And so, and those fantasies remain pretty constant and actually sort of steadily go up into the 40s mm -hmm. and that remain pretty high in the 40s and evidently don't start going down until well into one's 50s. Mm -hmm. So I found that really interesting. Yeah. Well, I find that really interesting in part because I really notice, especially among my female clients, that the 40s are a very common time for women to be craving that novelty, whether it's because their children are becoming more independent, maybe, or whether because, you know, sex drive is high among women in their 40s. But for whatever reason, that tends to be a time that women will come to me with that struggle of sort of, I don't know what to do with these feelings you know, whether it's their desire for their partner is decreased. And that, again, can be a man or it can be another woman and finding themselves having more desires for other people outside of the relationships or having fantasies about 
threesomes or what have you, it does seem like the 40s is a common time. For this real desire for novelty. Novelty. Yeah, right. exactly. And so helping people to understand that that's really a common thing, normal thing out there, rather than thinking this is a catastrophe right. and a bad sign for my right. my relationship is really, really important. Yeah. And what do you do with that? How do you process that? And part of it is the, what we're saying is, is that a woman in a woman's fantasy, a woman desires a lot of novelty. And what's interesting is I think sometimes men get a bad rap in our culture mm-hmm. <laughs> because we kind of think of the man as the one that wants to have multiple partners and seek novelty all the time. Mm-hmm. But the research on the fantasies actually doesn't show that, that men both in fantasy as well as in their relationship often are very turned on Mm -hmm. by being with the partner, Mm -hmm. a particular partner. They want romance in it. And a lot of times they're really having fantasies about pleasing their partner Mm -hmm. that if they can turn on that partner, that's very, very, very satisfying to them. And I see that a lot in my men's groups that the quantity of sex is less important to some of these guys than the quality and in particular the degree to which they can please their partner that that is the biggest turn on and that if their partner is just doing it you know kind of in an obligatory way that's just it's not satisfying that's not Mm -hmm. what it's about for them it's consistent with literature yeah that makes sense as well You know, and then women, interesting enough, what we were talking about before we got started is that women fantasize a lot more than men about BDSM. Mm -hmm. I guess that's not shocking for those of you in the Fifty Shades of Grey uh, (laughs) craze out there. (laughs) (laughs) But but also women tend to have a, a little bit more desire. It's not that women have less desire for sex. And I think women get a kind of a bad rap on that. But oftentimes women have less desire for the sex that they're getting. And then the perception that women tend to have lower sexual desire. I mean, we know in general that isn't actually true, but the perception that women have lower sexual desire, really it's often that women may feel at times lower sexual desire, but what ends up happening is that when given a novel situation, a novel person, all of a sudden that same woman Mm -hmm. can find themselves even through fantasy perked right up and having desire. And that can be troubling to women to recognize that. And this research says that's actually quite normal that women actually need more novelty Mm -hmm. in sexuality where men could focus on the person. Women's fantasies are often about novel situations, Mm -hmm. novel people, there's a craving for novelty. Right. Is that your experience in your practice? Yes. And it's partly because both the research and my experience would say that um, women's arousal and desire tends to be partly around being desired. So if you think about it that way, then, you know, being desired being as being the object of desire. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Which, you know, again, I mean, what's so hard about these things is it sounds very categorical, categorical and even sexist. I think what's hard about this is some of it sort of defies our volitional, rational brain, right? Mm-hmm. These are sort of things that are about ourselves that we don't have a lot of volitional control about. It's one of the things that people get have a lot of shame about when they talk to me about their fantasies. It's like, I can't help it. This thing just really turns me on, you know, and it's not something that we have volitional control over. But anyway, getting back to the being desired piece, of course, being desired by a novel object is different from being desired by your long term partner. So, you know, that novelty is going to really tend to kind of flip your switch in a way that fantasizing about your long term partner is unlikely to. Wait, Susan, just one second. Let's take a moment out to thank our sponsor. Now, our listeners come from all types of professions and backgrounds all over the world, and we're so happy about that. And we are also really honored that many of our subscribers are mental health professionals like Sue and myself. And like us, many of you did not become clinicians because you were ecstatic about focusing on the business aspect of your practice. We want our attention to be on our clients and other really important endeavors. And that is where Theranest comes in. Now, Theranest is a practice management system for mental health professionals And it can really help easily streamline your whole entire practice. It has a client portal for scheduling and great calendar organization. It has HIPAA compliant notes and documentation, 
one-click claim submissions, credit card processing, and one of the really great parts also, it has a really amazing live customer service. So there's no reason not to check it out. You can try it for free. And as a listener, they are offering you 20% off for the first three months. And how you would get that is you would go to theranist.com backslash therapist uncensored. We're also, we'll have a link on our website. So that is theranist.com backslash therapist uncensored. All right, let's get back to the show. Let me add to something before you jump into the communication about that. And one of the the speculations about that is that sexuality and desire requires quite a bit of Mm self-centeredness. It requires leaving the world and getting completely absorbed in yourself. And so some of the theory around this is that some of this is just social norms and that women and social norms have had less capability, that they're more focused on the nurturance and the outward pleasing so that the desire to be desired and to have novelty. When you have novelty, you can be totally absorbed in your own, who you are, who your experience is. How does this novel person see you? Right, right. Not about caretaking. Right. So you get to kind of be in your own sexual (laughs) narcissism. and, And it's a lot harder to do that. If your partner, whether it's a man or a woman, it's the same partner over the same period of time, having the same desire right. for you. It's right. less, you're less able to just get completely lost. Right, right. I mean, which is very interesting because I was going to say sort of caretaking or the feeling a need to caretake is kind of the enemy of the turn on, especially for women. I mean, it's interesting because for saying that for men, pleasing a woman is part of, you know, often a big theme in their turn ons, then that has a little bit of a caretaking theme to it. But for women, you know, I think partly because the role of women is so imbued in caretaking, it's the last thing that you you know, want mixed in with your sexuality. I hear that a lot from women that, you know, when they feel that caretaking role or that their partner is sort of regressing a little bit or kind of wants that from them, that's a real turnoff for them. So that's interesting. And again, none of these things is super easy to communicate to your partner, right? These are all so vulnerable and so deep and so sort of core to who we are, right, Anne? I mean, you know, that it's like one has to be really kind of ginger in a certain way in bringing them up and very much again owning what you bring to the table for them not to feel like an attack a criticism you know absolutely and I think that's one reason why we're really trying to promote the talking but also the educational piece I think the less shame and embarrassment and the more knowledge we have of course because I know that in a heterosexual couple it is and I was thinking in In same-sex couples, this is actually, I I should say this has come up almost the same way, but I'm specifically going to speak about heterosexual couples in this context, and that is that because men so often get excited by their partner's desire and pleasure, that sometimes it's very difficult for them not to get their feelings and their own sense of self injured or feeling hurt when their partner doesn't respond in the same way. And I guess that's actually going to be true for men or women, because I think this can happen, the less desirous, whether it's oh, same sex or not. Uh, yeah, yes. I always say, sort of say hell hath no fury like a woman spurned. In a case where a woman is the less desirous in a heterosexual couple, because they don't have sort of socialization on their side, like at least for men, when they're the person that's most desirous, you know, it's sort of like, oh, it's a boys club of like, oh, my wife never wants to have sex. If you're a woman and you're feeling sexually rejected by your partner, especially your male partner, that so defies the stereotype that it has that extra layer of shame. I just sort of oh, wanted yes. to throw that out there. That's you know? so, so true. Really good point. And then to get to the differences for the woman that can come out in the relationship, though, if coming back to the more heterosexual example in this one, if a woman isn't responding where the male's attribution is, oh, like if you really want me and if you find me attractive, you're going to have all this desire and they believe that then how does the woman express, well, no, actually fantasizing over there, Mm -hmm. it makes it pretty difficult to talk about. Right. And trying to normalize that for yourself, I think is really helpful. Some women, well, people in general, feel that fantasizing about anyone but the person they're with is wrong in some way. That if they kind of require the use of fantasy to kind of up their arousal, that there's something wrong with them. And that is 
absolutely not the case. I mean, oh, that's, that's so true. Yeah, especially in a long-term relationship. But it so shuts people down that like, no wonder they're not feeling desire if they're censoring themselves, right? Or certain types of fantasies don't feel kosher for them. And again, biggest enemy of <laughs> arousal and desire, censorship, right? You know, right. The last thing you want to do is be watching what you're thinking or fantasizing about and judging that. That's not a turn on. No. And how are you going to, if you can't own your own desire and what turns you on and being able to express that in a, because one, you feel somehow it's wrong to have these fantasies about novel people, or if you actually tell your partner that it's going to wound them, well, that's kind of a lose, lose situation to find yourself in. Right. And what you're saying can shut down your whole sexual experience of even being able to ignite your desire. Right. Right. And on that topic, all fantasies do not need to be shared. It's okay to have your private experience. And if that's a reason why you shut your fantasy life down, because somehow you think that it's wrong to have a fantasy that you can't share, that's just not, in my view anyway, accurate. I think there's plenty of times when we're just allowed to have our own private experience, which does not preclude, I mean, obviously, and we were going to talk about this, that, you know, sharing fantasies, whether they're in the service of trying to like introduce new ideas of what you would like to do or just in the service of spicing things up and like connecting to your partner. Absolutely a really great route to that. Great great route to adding that sense of novelty and fun and lightness and connection. Yeah. To not be afraid to share it. But I like your point. That doesn't mean every thought that comes to your mind needs to be shared. And you might even have to practice developing fantasies because we've done discussions about desire in and of itself. And more often women, but some men as Mm -hmm. well, don't actually experience desire first. They experience desire once in sexual contact Mm -hmm. and once something, whether it's fantasy, pornography, et cetera, or the actual act of being touched. Mm -hmm. It's like they're not in the mood. They don't feel the mood, but once it gets, starts getting going, all of a sudden the desire comes. Right. And those things also, that process is a real arc in people's lives. You know, so uh, for instance, you know, during adolescence, during women in the forties, especially for women, you know, there may oh, be point. periods of time that like, you're just walking around feeling more horny than other times, you know, then, then you get into menopause or post menopause and then you might require a little bit more stimulation to get to the same place that you were able to get to. 10 years before. So what you're saying is one of the arcs being in your 40s for women, don't be surprised if that happens. And then if you have that arc and at the same time, the higher desire for novelty, that could be a really high risk period if you're not turning to yourself and understanding that and talking about it with your partner. Right, right. Which, you know, is easier said than done, obviously, when, you know, you've got the feelings of your partner involved as well. Absolutely. But, you know, the other things that I suggest maybe in kind of readying oneself to talk to one's partner about any of these, whether it's desire, discrepancy, sexual boredom, fantasies, techniques of what you want or don't want, ways that they may kiss you. I mean, all these things that we've just talked about, how you instigate sex is just you can turn to things like journaling, talking to a friend, talking to a therapist. Oh, I like that. Talking to a friend, because when Absolutely. you bring things up to a friend and you feel more normalized, oh, totally. then you practice actually talking about totally. it. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Listening to podcasts, whether it's yourself or with your partner. I loved a story where someone's partner walked in and they were listening to Esther Perel while they were doing dishes. And that just prompted this whole conversation. You just kind of more spontaneously versus having to bring it up out of the blue, you know, right. just kind of set the mood for it. And again, there's so much available out there as far as books, podcasts, videos that can kind of help you get some language, get some, you know, ideas on how to talk about things on what it is that you're actually wanting to change in your sex life. Yeah, exactly. Educating yourself and helping your partner educate. So it part of what we're focusing on is it takes the awkwardness, the embarrassment and the shame out of it. And especially if you can say, Oh, guess what? Like there's a lot of people that actually experience difficulty feeling desire until they're midway into sex. And that could be something that's just an opening for the two of you instead of this period of assumptions and negativity and hostility that can come from that dynamic. Again, there's so, so many areas of sexuality where people feel alone, where they don't need to feel alone. 
That's so true. And I think one last point to make is just that so many of the kind of rules of communication, if you will, that apply to everything else, like I statement, good old I statements from the 80s or 70s. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, and really, you know, owning your own reactions and responses and not blaming. And they apply to the sexual dialogue as well. And sometimes perspective taking, perspective really taking, exactly, taking the perspective, really, right, trying to empathize and take the perspective of the other person mm-hmm. exactly. rather than just defending. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. If we could just. I always sort of say, if we could just take the defensiveness out of dialogue in couples, it yeah. would just be like world changing. Um, Absolutely. But yes, all those same guidelines to communication, you know, do apply to sexual communication. Somehow, sometimes they can go out the window because of anxiety or shame or discomfort or just lack of experience, you know? Yeah. Before we wrap up, um, are there any particular resources that you might steer couples or individuals oh, yeah. to? Can <laughs> you give us favorites. a few? All right. What, do you, what are some of your favorites? <laughs> well, my I would have to say my favorite books, and I know some people, most of these people also have things like TED Talks or podcasts. Or, so my favorite thinkers on this are Esther Perel, as we've, as we've talked about. Mating in Captivity. Mating in Captivity, yeah. yes. There's the book, actually, also I was referencing, The Erotic Mind is another book that the author, Morin, interviewed like, I don't know, a thousand people on their sexual fantasy. So it was where I think it was somewhere in the hundreds of people about their sexual fantasies and what they find erotic. That's very normalizing and fun and exciting kind of a turn on actually. So the erotic mind, the tired woman's guide to passionate sex. I recommend that a lot. (laughs) I love that one too. (laughs) Those are probably my three go-to's that I think have been most beneficial. And, and again, those people also, a lot of those authors have done podcasts or TED Talks as well. Definitely Esther Perel has. So, yeah. All right. Well, Susan, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was really fun. And I think we could spin off in about four different directions on this topic. So it's yeah. been hard to contain, but we'll come back and do another one. Awesome. Well, it's been a, it's been a great time. Thanks so much, Anne. And thank you for joining us. And if you like what you've heard, we feel really appreciate if you pass it on. But would really, this is a labor of love. And if you could stop and take some time to rate and review us, we would really appreciate it. You could also join us at our Facebook page and become part of our community at therapistuncensored.com. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you around the bend. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson.